Dear moderator, you can start your talk just after 10 seconds. Yeah. Uh, Rifu, you, you better tell Kamrul to start the procedure. Yes, sir. After 10 seconds, you can start. Uh, I'll let you know. Asif, are you here? So I'm here, sir. Should I start? Now? You can start. Yes, sir. Okay. We're live now. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, dear respected mm -hmm. physicians. Welcome you all in today's lecture session presentation organized by ECG Study Group. Today is our 44th lecture, and today's topic is AV conduction disturbances and abnormalities. And the presenter today is a special one, Dr. Avishek from Mayo Clinic. Before starting the procedure or the lecture, I'd like to request Professor Abdul Wadi Choudhury, sir, to speak about. Avishek, Deshmo, and we proceed then on. What is it, sir? Good evening, everybody, and assalamu alaikum. Before starting the program, I have to uh, say to the audience that our Dr. Tushar is actually suffering from COVID. Still, he is here to start the program. That's very graceful of him. And I'm praying to God Almighty that he should get well very soon. Uh, now, Today's lecture will be given by Dr. Abhishek Dashpo. He's a uh, cardiac electrophysiologist and an outcome researcher. He's a co-program director for electrophysiology fellowship program at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Dashpo performs invasive procedure, such as catheter ablation and device implantation to treat heart rhythm disorders. He is specifically interested in ablations and device management of patients with infiltrative cardiomyopathies and adult congenital heart diseases. He has an active research program where he uses large database to examine quality, outcomes, and the risk prediction for heart rhythm disorders. He has been voted as the teacher of the year many times. Today, we are going to observe why he has been voted like that. We have enjoyed his lecture before, and I may at least myself eagerly awaiting to uh, hear from him in today's lecture. Dr. Abhishek Dashmu, the field is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good evening everybody and hope Dr. Tushar you feel uh, better soon. You know, I hope we get over this uh, COVID pandemic sooner and everybody remains healthy. So I'll share my slide and make. Uh, let me know if this is uh, you can see it and you you yeah. can hear me. Okay, yeah, perfect. perfect. So our main learning objectives today, when we talk about AV conduction abnormalities, is really to have a systematic approach to uh, slow heart rates on ECGs. And when do we uh, think this is AV conduction or SA node conduction disease, and how to really tease through each of these things? We'll talk about that. And then finally, if we can use this ECG as a clinical pathological uh, a tool for more correlation of what might be going on clinically with that uh, patient. So when we think of AV conduction abnormalities on the ECG, the first step really is to find out if it is really a true AV conduction abnormality. If it is true, is it physiological or pathological? Is it dangerous for the patient? And then is it, are we getting AV conduction abnormalities because is it a failure of impulse generation or we, get, we are getting AV block due to failure of impulse propagation. And then finally, uh, you know, if based on the ECG, if we can predict what could be the underlying pathology and then what are the clues on the ECG that can help me acutely and actively with that particular patient. So this is in the broad term how, how I would approach an ECG when I'm thinking there is some AV conduction abnormality going on. So when we think of AV conduction abnormality, our main aim is to find out if there is a problem in the, P, in the PR interval. Now we all know that QRS is a vector or a summation of vector from LV and RV activation. And the PR interval is actually the onset of time from atrial depolarization to the ventricular depolarization. So whenever we think of a PR interval, we always think of AV node,
but it is little bit beyond the AV node. It is really the time it takes from the sinus impulse firing through the atrium. And then when it reaches the AV node, that's basically our PR interval. So once we understand that the PR interval is not only what happens in the AV node, but also what happens in the atrium, I think then it can tune us more to identify the block, maybe even identify the underlying pathology the patient might be happening. We all know that the AV node is a very, very septal structure. So when the activation is going towards the AV node, then from there it goes to the bundle branch blocks and then activates the uh, left and the right uh, ventricles. So let's start off with this ECG. Uh, why is the rhythm slow? And maybe we can do an audience poll. Sinus bradycardia, AV block, beta blocker overdose or pseudo sinus bradycardia. Can we start the poll, please? Nipu, can we start the poll? Yes, sir. Starting the poll. So why is this rhythm so slow in this patient? Heart rate 39 beats per minute. Is there AV block, beta block or overdose, sinus bradycardia? or what might be really going on with this patient. All right, can we see the, can we see the result? Ribu cut the poll time, so yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. 15 seconds, yeah. So we can see the screen. Uh, Answer A is 22%, answer B is 28%, and beta blocker overdose is 22% again. And lastly, pseudo sinus bradycardia is showing 28%. Over wonderful. Wonderful. So, so wonderful. So this is what exactly I wanted to know. There is a wide spread in the responses. And here I think we could make a point that why is this rhythm slow? So, whenever this is actually pseudo sinus bradycardia. So I'll talk to you a little bit more about this. So whenever the patient has a slow heart rate, the first step is really identify, is it a sinus bradycardia or is there a problem in the AV conduction? So you, here you can see the PR interval is pretty good in the beats which conducts. So maybe this may be a, a something funny here going on that might be cluing us in whether this is two to one AV block or is it something else going on? When we approach this ECG, it is critical to know how the P wave looks like in a particular patient. So if this is the P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave. And suddenly on the T wave or suddenly close to the T wave, you get a very funny looking beat. So you have a P wave here, P wave here. The T wave has happened, but there is a very funny beat here, which looks quite sharp, quite pointed compared to the sinus P beat. So if this P wave is, is, is the, if this is a genuinely uh, uh, sinus, this if it's general, genuinely a atrial depolarization or P wave, it really cannot be the sinus P because the sinus P looks like this, positive and then negative, and this is all positive. So when that happens, think that you're having a PAC, premature atrial complex. And it is not uncommon that a lot of patients have these PACs they kind of land on top of the uh, uh, T wave. And when you have a PAC, it can actually suppress the sinus node. That's why you can have this pause and then you have sinus rhythm starting again. Now this can also happen in a pattern of bigeminy. So we know PVCs can happen in bigeminy, but even PACs can happen in bigeminy. And what if these PACs as they're happening in bigeminy are getting blocked? So that may give you a false appearance that you are having a two to one AV block, but actually this is just blocked PAC and nothing needs to be done for this uh, and certainly no indication for a pacemaker. So again, going back to our ECG, so sinus rhythm, QRS, T wave, and a very positive P wave, which is very sharp, very pointed. And that tells us this is a PAC. It is just that this PAC gets blocked suppresses the sinus node. So the next P wave happens, QRS happens. And this is happening in a pattern. 
and then towards the end these pacs go away and you get resumption of sinus rhythm again so this is an example of pseudo sinus bradycardia now when we look at yes, a sir, sinus yes sir. yes sir yeah if the patient complains with uh, dizziness, dizziness in this mm -hmm. pattern with this ecg can we straight away go for pacs by giving a pop yes so whenever the... something else because <laughs> so if, if the, the patient complains about dizziness or uh, vertigo or yes so the patient can complain if the patient is symptomatic and they are having blocked pac what i try to do is increase the heart rate so the way you could do that you can just take the patient for a walk and see if the pac is go away if the pac is go away and the patient is still dizzy and light headed you know that the pac is not causing any of those symptoms so it is just like a quick stress test you can do at bedside have them do some exercise increase the sinus rate so that these pacs you know get suppressed and then you know the if the symptoms resolve then it might be pacs symptoms don't resolve then you have to call ent neurology other people involved to figure out why they are having vertigo and dizziness is that okay Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Now, next, it is important. I have a quick question. Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. Why do you pseudo? Because it is not true bradycardia. That's why I call it pseudo bradycardia. So okay. next, we we'll look. Next, we we'll look at the P wave morphology. Now, we all know that lead V one P wave is positive and terminal part is negative. and one avl the p wave is positive so this is helpful because when we are looking at these pacs important to know that how the sinus p looks like and whether those pacs are looking different compared to what we are seeing on the on the block pac so they can be quite dramatic that you may even think there is a 2 to 1 av block here but actually there is again a pac again a clue would be to look at the t wave if the t wave is looking different where there is a block think that there is a pac which has happened and really nothing needs to be done for that this particular patient so when we think of bradycardia we are obviously thinking of sinus node dysfunction and uh, av block so we'll change gear to this patient so 84 year old gentleman with syncope what might be going on here i don't have an audience poll but is this av block or is it sinus node dysfunction so we can just have a and b sinus node dysfunction is number 1 av block is number 2 so sinus node stop. yeah i'll stop sharp at 30 second so it's on okay so sinus node dysfunction number 1 av block number 2 so as people are thinking you know you have pr interval pr interval t wave looks the same so there is no block pac t wave and boom there is no p wave anywhere qrs and then maybe there might be something here and a t wave very good so result this, in your screen okay great so i think a lot of people identified it correctly this is potentially an episode of uh, sinus block or block in the sinus node or sino atrial exit block and we'll talk about that and then you have this junctional beat with sinus node restarting again so when we think of sinus node exit block again i'm i'm showing this in the topic for av block because sometimes it becomes confusing so in our own mind when we think of patterns that uh, you know you have group beating then we think of wenke bach you have fixed you know 2 to 1 type block then we think of av block but before we see that we got to understand what is being blocked so in this first panel you in this first panel you can see p wave qrs p wave qrs p wave qrs no p wave and then p wave and qrs so there was no p wave and that no p wave resulted in no qrs so failure of impulse generation that the impulse did not ge get generated in the sinus node same thing happens here there is no p wave well you may say is this block pac but no because the t wave is exactly the same so this cannot be a block pac so it is just failure of impulse generation from the sinus node 
Compared to here, so this is an example of sinoatrial exit block MOBITS1, where you can have group beating, no block PAC, and there is no P wave in this pause. Compared to sinoatrial exit uh, a block MOBITS type 2, where you have sinus rhythm going on, and suddenly there is a block without the P wave. The fact that there is no P wave, we know that this has to be a block in the SA node, because if there was a P wave followed by no QRS, then the block would be at the level of AV node. So the fact that there is no P wave here, it tells you that the block happened in at the level of the sinus node. And then for MOBITS2 sinoatrial exit block, the P to P interval is constant and, and the pause is basically twice the P to P interval. So if you look here, this P to P interval is constant and the pause here is twice of the P to P interval. So that is SA exit, uh, SA node exit block MOBITS type two. So you the fact that you can have Venkibak or MOBITS2 in AV node, you can also have it in the SA node and the treatment can be different because these patients would need a pacemaker if you have this kind of sinus node dysfunction. Another story here, patient is getting monitored for some medical condition and the nurse calls you at 11.30 at night that the patient is having this. So what should we do? Number one, go back to sleep. Number two, pacemaker. So I'm launching the pole. Okay. Yeah. So 11.30 at night, nurse calls you that the patient or your resident calls you that the patient is having a long pause. So what is your next step? Number one, you tell the patient or you tell the nurse or the resident to go back to sleep. Or number two, you come and do the pacemaker. All right. So what is the answer? Yeah, sir, I'm giving uh, people a colic, so I'm giving another two, three seconds extra to them. So okay. we, are, we, are, we are almost done. So yeah, I end the poll and now I share the result. Good. Some of them said that the uh, person who called you can go back to sleep. Other people would sit in their car on the, or on their bike and come and do the pacemaker. Good. So good spread. So let's look at I'm glad this. that you did not uh, give a third option that call your intervention is for a temporary wear. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't give that option because that should never be an option, right? For this ECG. Exactly, exactly. Good. So let's because look I'm, at this. I'm an interventionalist. Yes, sir. So let's see this ECG or this telemetry. You have PQRS, 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 PQRS. And then the P to P gets longer and the QRS to QRS gets longer. And then there is no heartbeat for a few seconds here. And then, you know, heartbeat starts again. And again, you have a long pause and heartbeat starts again. So the fact that this is not happening suddenly, there is prolongation of the P2P interval, prolongation of the R2R interval during sleeping hours means this is just high vagal tone uh, during sleep. And uh, really nothing needs to be done for this. No indication for pacemaker. And, you know, I, we should just uh, tell our patients to get checked for sleep apnea, you know, or lose weight and all that, but really no indication for pacemaker for this particular situation. No indication even for a temporary uh, pacemaker for this kind of patient. So, you know, these blocks will recover and I would just wait and watch and uh, see how things go. So this is again, pause during sleep and nothing needs to be done. So when we think of... Uh, AV blocks, we think a block at the level of, uh, of uh, AV node. So first degree AV block would be just prolongation of PR interval. Mobits type 1 or Venki uh, will show you some example. Mobits 2, 2 to 1 AV block, advanced heart block, and then a complete heart block. So this is an example of first degree AV block where just the PR interval is slightly prolonged, but there is no AV block noted anywhere. This is an example of MOBITS type 1 AV block. So PR gets longer, longer, longer blocks, and then you have return PR is quite short. Again, critical to know when it blocks, whether it blocks in the P wave or blocks in the AV node. 
So again, if you look closely at the, these T waves, and actually T waves are your friend when you look at these things, is look at this T wave compared to this T wave. The fact that this is more pointed and notchy compared to this tells you there is a P wave which is hiding here. And that's what uh, you got a P wave and then it blocked and then the return P wave, PR interval was shorter. So this is Mobitz type one AV block. This is Mobitz type two second degree AV block where you have P, QRS, P, QRS, P, no QRS. And again, P, QRS, P, QRS. So this is kind of a block of Mobitz type two AV block. Now, interesting thing, sometimes you will see here that this P2P interval is longer compared to the P2P interval where there is actually conduction happening. And that if you read like classic ECG textbook, they call, call it as ventriculophasic uh, respiration. So this is an example of uh, Mobitz type 2 second degree heart block. So when we think of Wenckebach or Mobitz type 1 AV block, what is exactly the same is actually the P2P interval. So the P2P interval doesn't change. The PR interval gets longer, longer and blocks and the returning PR is the shortest. And again, the PR interval gets longer and longer and blocks. But even more important is that when you look at the block, the, the duration of the block should be less than twice the preceding RR interval. Because sometimes it's really confusing if you don't see the P wave or the T wave is not, uh, you know, uh, or looks very, very similar. Main thing would be to just look at the block interval. And if that block interval is less than two times the preceding RR interval, then this is more, uh, then this is Wenckebach. In second degree type two AV block, the P2P interval again remains the same. PR interval remains the same, but the block is exactly twice the preceding uh, twice R to R interval. So if the block is mathematically exactly the same, as twice the prior R to R interval that is consistent with second degree type two AV block. So important concept to know because generally for second degree type one AV block, you don't need a pacemaker. Second degree type two AV block, we have to be, cons uh, we have to be start thinking of a pacemaker if the patient is symptomatic. Another thing to remember, however, for patients with Wenckebach or even Mobitz one uh, or even uh, 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 first degree AV block, if the PR interval is longer, say more than 250 milliseconds, and the patient has say myotonic dystrophy or some neuromuscular disorder, then they are they actually need a pacemaker. So the only time you would give a pacemaker when the PR interval is longer uh, is uh, without an AV block is somebody with the myotonic dystrophy. So it's a point to remember. This is an example of two to one AV block. Again, P, QRS, P, QR, no QRS, P and QRS again. And again, the fact that this alternate uh, P doesn't conduct to the QRS, that tells you that this block is at the level of AV node and two to one AV block. This is high degree AV block where you have more many Q P waves, but they don't create enough QRSs. But the, but, uh, so this is high degree or advanced AV block. And then this is complete heart block where there is complete AV dissociation, meaning you have P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave is going at its own rate. QRS is going at its own rate and the P waves are really not talking to the QRS. So kind of dissociated rhythm. So this is complete heart block. Now we, it's important to know these various patterns because you know not everybody with these things need a pacemaker. So even if you have a transient complete heart block at during sleeping hours and patient is snoring away to glory, you really don't need a pacemaker for those kind of uh, patients. But sometimes it becomes tricky that you know if somebody has two to one AV block, we see it on a holter or some monitor or the patient is even sleeping, when to be really concerned about. So again, if you remember the electricity in the heart goes from the SA node, AV node, his bundle, and then the bundle branch blocks. If there is a block at the AV node, then at least the his may fire and you may have a resumption of conduction. But if the block is at the level of his, then you are extremely concerned and those are the patients who would need a pacemaker sooner than later. So how to sort this out clinically? So generally, when there is a block at the AV node, the PR interval is longer the QRS is much more narrower and the escape is very similar to the escape what you see with the QRS. 
I would not suggest this to do it, but the block will actually worsen with vagal maneuvers. But the trick what you can do is to take the patient for a walk. If you take the patient for a walk and is in two to one AV block, and as the heart rate increases, the block gets better. That means the block is at the level of AV node and that patient doesn't need an urgent pacemaker. On the other hand, if the QRS is wider, the QRS with conducted beat is different and narrower compared to the escape QRS. And actually, if you take the patient for a walk and the block worsens with exercise, then think that the level of block is at the level of his bundle. And then the, those are the patients who need a pacemaker. So common things, sometimes somebody comes for a treadmill stress test. They go for exercise. During peak exercise, they have AV block or two to one AV block. That's a bad marker. That's a marker that this patient needs a pacemaker, may even be ischemic to have exercise-induced AV block. So important to know that we identify these patients and get them a pacemaker. We'll talk about a few clinical scenarios. So 75-year-old female with bradycardia, which doctor would you call? Number one, cardiologist. Number two, endocrinologist. Number three, nephrologist. What is the potassium level? Oh, Dr. Vadud already astutely answered. So good. So even before you call a doctor, you just check a potassium level. And any guess, what do you think would be the potassium level here, sir? Based on this ECG? Uh, at least uh, around seven or more. Oh, at least seven or more. Less. Actually, the potassium was exactly 7.2 here. So the, the Dr. Vadud astutely pointed out that this is hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia can also cause bradycardia, maybe sometimes AV block. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, we, we need to check the potassium. Potassium was actually 7.2 after dialysis. So nephrologist came in, the potassium got better, 4.8, and the AV conduction improved. So again, important to know that not all AV blocks and bradycardia, you have to call a cardiologist and sometimes our nephrology friends can also help us to treat this hyperkalemia. This can help in correcting this cause. So just some pointers about hyperkalemia, just tall T wave, your potassium is 5.5 to 6.5. But when you have tall T waves with loss of P waves, as we saw, then the potassium is between 6.5 and 7.5. So in our patient, the potassium was 7.2. And when the uh, potassium is higher, then you have more QRS widening, uh, asystole, arrhythmias, and everything else. But say between potassium 6.5 and 7.5, T wave is taller, you lose the P wave, sign P wave pattern, then start to think that this is hyperkalemia. All right. <coughs> now, we talked briefly about arrhythmias and sleep. So this is another tracing where during sleeping hours, you have PR prolongation, prolongation blocks. But again, it, this happened at uh, you know 12.56 uh, a.m. and really nothing to do. But sometimes these things become dangerous. So if they start to have some non-sustained VT during sleep, during bradycardia, that's a bad marker. So those are the patients I would actually offer them a pacemaker. Because what happens if you have bradycardia you get these short, long, short sequences. And so suddenly the heart rate is changing. Sometimes it is fast with the bradycardia or pause, the heart rate becomes very long. Then it becomes short again, and you can have this non-sustained VT. So if you have these arrhythmias with uh, pauses or blocks, and in the middle of that, you're having some non-sustained VT, that's not a good sign. Those are the patients I would consider actively for a pacemaker. So not everybody with bradycardia at night needs a pacemaker, but if the bradycardia is causing some short, or short runs of VT, then think of pacemaker for those patients. But we will not consider ICDs. Did. No, 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 not ICD, because you treat the yeah. heart slow hearted and the patient will get better. So generally nocturnal bradycardia itself is not an indication for pacemaker, but you should screen for sleep apnea and all those things. And that will you know help a lot in finding out why they are bradycardic. But VT during sleep, is, it's not good. And those are the patients who need to get a paste. I saw a question on the chat about ACS and complete heart block. So this is an ECG. 
so someone coming in with chest pain whom should they see interventional cardiologist number 2 electrophysiologist so i have launched the i have launched the poll so we'll wait for some time okay. only give 10 seconds it should it should not take more than 10 seconds yeah it's i have another three more seconds done okay interventional cardiologist or electrophysiologist fantastic interventional cardiologist good so acute mi can also cause heart block so this is a classic example of uh, inferior wall mi so you can see st elevation 2 3 avf three more than avf and then two is the le least and then you have this sinus tachycardia actually going on with a complete heart block so these are the patients who need revascularization first and generally as a rule patients with inferior wall mi with complete heart block will uh, will recover generally as a rule so uh, you know this is uh, 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 the angiogram of that patient you know you can clearly see the artery was blocked and then treated another patient here uh, chest pain heart block and again some st changes you know three more than uh, avf more than two so again kind of a proximal rca in fart but here what happened in that particular patient there was a lesion in the proximal rca but you can see there is no blood going in the posterolateral branch so you so the, this is a posterolateral branch which actually supplies the av node and there was no blood supply going there so once this uh, the proximal rca was stented and the flow in the pl branch was restored you can see a large pl branch going all the way up to the av node the patient's av conduction got better so generally when we think of av block in inferior wall mi think of basal jarex reflex increase vagal tone secondary to ischemia there can also be ischemia to the sa node or av node you know a lot of these patients get morphine so it can cause some bradycardia and reperfusion bradycardia is also known in these uh, patients so a lot of times patients with inferior wall mi would get bradycardia and heart block but they generally don't require pacemaker at least by guidelines you can wait for several weeks before considering a pacemaker different story what's going on here and which doctor would you call intensivist cardiologist or electrophysiologist the time starts now so patient comes in with worsening shortness of breath and uh, somebody in the casualty or emergency room notices the av block and they uh, think you know this patient because of slow heart rate and patient is had near syncopal event so they want to give a pacemaker but uh, you walk in as an internal medicine doctor and you think well this is not as clean as it may sound but there is something else going on so what's going on here so a uh, little bit of mixed bag result as of now we we'll wait another 10 seconds i am on a call for 10 minutes so all so right I, so i end the poll and i share the result just a second yeah good yeah so so good good spread again so again this is uh, venki bach morbid's type 1 av block but again we talked about morbid's type 1 av block doesn't need a pacemaker but what's actually going on with this patient can somebody just shout out and tell me what's going on pvc okay what else So anyway, I, I don't I don't understand Bengali. So what what did you say? Doctor Vadu, what do you think? What's going on with this patient? If I can ask you. Actually, hey, sorry, I missed the. Yeah, I was talking on the ICU. No, no, no. But just what is go? So, so your ICU doctor just called you. Somebody yeah. is with Mobitz AV block, and they send you this ECG. So what would you think is going on with this patient? The patient has one kind of phenomena, but the point is. why he is having this pvcs yes but beyond that what else is going on so when we think of these uh, uh, situations you know we look at venki bach we look at pvcs but if you look at the big picture 
This is classic S1 Q3 T3 pattern, yes. which is seen in acute pulmonary embolism. Yeah. So when you have a massive pulmonary embolism, patients can have syncope. They can also have a very high vagal tone like basal Jarek's reflex, and they can have Mobitz type 1 AV block. So when you're looking at any ECG, you know, whatever our specialty is, you know, we have to look at the big picture. And just based on this S1, Q3, T3, a CT was performed, massive pulmonary embolism was noted and then treated. But then the question was, why did the patient did not become tachycardic? Because sinus tachycardia is the most common finding for pulmonary embolism. But if you have a really massive pulmonary embolism, you can have high vagal tone, basal Jarek's reflex, and that can cause bradycardia and Mobitz type 1 AV block. So something to think about. And it's also a not uncommon that you can see this acute pulmonary embolism type pattern when you have these episodes. So this is an example of a complete heart block in somebody who is 45 years of age. So generally, when you think of young patients with complete heart block or high AV block, think of degenerative conditions, infectious causes, rheumatic autoimmune diseases, infiltrative diseases, neuromuscular disorders, radiation in induced, a lot of these things can uh, cause heart block. Now, I think I'll skip this and I wanted to show one more example here. What is going on here? So you have a P wave, QRS, P wave and no QRS. Sometimes what can happen, the P wave can go to QRS but that same P, you may not have a P wave, but that second P, the first P wave can also make another QRS that is called as double firing. So one SA node is creating activation going down the fast pathway and the slow pathway, or this can also be junctional, uh, junctional escape or junctional beat. So, you know, so, so this is not AV block. There is no block here. It is just that same, Q, same P wave is creating a QRS and another QRS. So kind of double fire or can also be seen in junctional uh, junctional rhythm. So junctional rhythm can be of different shapes and sizes. So sometimes we look at these retrograde P waves, but when you're having a junctional rhythm, the junction is firing and then it's really the race who wins. Does the QRS wins or the P wave wins? If the atrium or the P wave wins, the P wave is going to be before the QRS. If the ventricle wins, meaning the QRS wins, the P wave is going to be after the QRS. So you can get junctional rhythm of uh, various forms and uh, shapes. So P wave before QRS may not have any P wave if there's block to the atrium or even P wave after the QRS. Lastly, certain congenital heart disease are at a risk for AV block, common being a congenitally corrected transposition of great arteries. So normally blood goes from right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery. But in these patients, the blood goes from right atrium, left ventricle, and then the pulmonary artery. So the ventricles are, uh, are flipped. So whenever the atrium and ventricle and the ventricle and the artery is flipped, it is called as AV discordance, and that is CCTGA. Why this is important? Because we know the septal activation happens from left to right. So that's why you have Q wave in one and AVL. In these conditions, because the septal activation is happening from right to left, they don't get a Q wave in one and AVL. So that's your clue. Young patient, complete heart block. Why would there not be the septal activation be abnormal? So think this is a congenitally corrected transposition. They're at a high risk for uh, AV block. So this is why an ECG of that patient and got a device and then get uh, got better. And lastly, I wanted to show you this one last ECG on paced rhythm. So you can see atrial pacing and a very long PR interval. So like we said in the beginning, that PR interval is the onset of atrial depolarization to the ventricular depolarization. But sometimes you can have atrial pacing and you can still have a P wave after that. That means the conduction in the atrium is so slow that if you pace somewhere, it goes, makes a P wave, and then goes and makes a QRS. So this is actually not this long of a PR interval, but this long of a PR interval. And that also tells you that it's not always that AV prolonged, uh, prolonged PR interval is because of conduction disease in the AV node, but can also be significantly seen when there is a lot of scar going on in the, uh, in the atrium. So in summary, you know, when we look at these ECGs with AV block or slow heart rate, develop a plan, 
see what is block, what is conducted. So if there is a block C, if there is a block PAC or truly a block in the sinus node, sinus node dysfunction or a block in the AV node, look for the P waves, look for the T waves, see if the T waves are more pointed compared to the P waves. And then try to correlate, correlate this physiology with the ECG pattern and not the ECG pattern with the physiology. Because if you correlate physiology with ECG pattern, so sleep, bradycardia, high vagal tone, no need for a pacemaker. But in, think of it that way rather than thinking, oh, just because somebody has AV block, regardless of the time of the day, they need a pacemaker. So you, we might be doing a lot of unnecessary things to our patients. So just look at physiology and then look at uh, ECG patterns. And I think that will help you a lot, a long way in taking care of your patients. So I think I'll stop here and thank you very much for the kind invitation. Sorry, I went overboard. I have few other no, things no, no. and maybe we, we can really discuss it some it. other time. Yeah. And, and Dr. Deshmukh, if you wish, you can go on a little bit more. We are really enjoying it. And for your information, uh, many of our audience is also from Nepal. Yes. Our uh, Nepalese... Uh, Colleagues and friends are also joined there as faculties, and the yes. audience is also their residents at Karnulish, young Karnulish there. They also Good. join us. Good. So I think I'll stop here, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to take some. I'll just stop share. Dr. Arun, do you have a question? Professor Arun Maski is professor of cardiology in yeah, Nepal. Yeah, I'm enjoying his lectures. Very nice and basic lectures. Refreshing ECGs. That's very fantastic one. Thank you, sir. Nice lecture. And we have a lot of uh, MD residents here joining. Good. So they, they, they enjoy this ECG lectures. Thank you for your, for your excellent and wonderful lecture. Thank you. I hope they all pick up a few things. Just look at P wave, look at QRS, try to see where the block is. And don't, once you get this basic understanding, you are going to write an ECG book yourself. So no need of reading ECG book to know, you know, to look at these patterns. You know, once you understand this basic concept, that itself is good enough for you to identify any possible ECGs. So I wish you all the very best. Thank you, Dr. Deshmu. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Jamil, do you want to comment? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Deshmukh, for a nice deliberation. I was just having recapitulation of my knowledge. Many of things uh, was not theoretically, um, I was forgotten many things, and I have just recapitulated those things. And these are the basic things which uh, all the fellows should know. Uh, as because in examination, these things are frequently set in the, uh, in the exam as well as in the Bible. Thank you very much. So, uh, I, really, of, I really uh, enjoyed the uh, ECG, particularly with the prolonged peer interval, the pacing ECG. And that's something I didn't ever think of, but that's very nice of you to show it. I can even show you one more ECG. This also comes up a lot when you have uh, Epstein's anomaly. So again, in Epstein's anomaly, what happens is that the atrium is very scarred, but there is really no problem with the AV node. I don't know if you can see my ECG. Yeah, we yes, can. we can see it. Yeah, you can get an Epstein's type pattern, but the PR interval gets longer in those patients. Again, Epstein doesn't involve the AV node. It's only involving the atrium. But because of scarring and slow, slow conduction in the atrium, rheumatic heart disease, you know, severe uh, uh, Sjogren's rheumatological disease, wherever you have any slow conduction in the atrium, the PR interval is longer because of intraatrial conduction disease, not in the AV conduction disease. Great. Uh, Dr. Avishek, if we can uh, share just two more ECG and then make a quick fire round. Anything, whatever you think. So our people will be happy and junior will be learning many things. So if you have a quick rapid fire round, maybe two, three I'll questions. Just, I'll yeah. just show one ECG and then uh, we can stop. Yeah, certainly. Can you see this? Yeah. Can you make a full screen? Yeah. Now, 
Uh, if you can ask the question, then we can definitely go for the polls. Question is: Is the ECG is the pacemaker working or not working? Okay, so we started the yes. poll. Yes. Wait for thirty seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Question is the pacemaker working or not working? Yes or no? So atrial pacing QRS, atrial pacing QRS, atrial pacing QRS, atrial pacing no QRS. No QRS. Atrial pacing, ventricular pacing, atrial pacing QRS. So what happened here? Is the pacemaker working? This is again part of an AV block, you know, as we see. But is the pacemaker working or not working? So again, a beautiful mix back. <laughs> okay. So good. So <laughs> half of some of them say pacemaker is working. Some say pacemaker is not working. So you know the job of the pacemaker is to pace. But there are certain funny algorithms which are programmed to minimize ventricular pacing. One of them is called as uh, management. Is, 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 is this uh, patient is in AI mode? Yes. So this pace, so some of these modes work in AI mode and, and then, uh, then they change their, and then they have a mode switch. So what happens here, you have sinus rhythm going on. Then you have A paced V sense, A paced V sense. Then you, as the PR interval prolongs, you can have A pace with no QRS. As soon as the device sees there was no QRS, then the AV, then it gives a backup ventricular pacing. Yeah. And this thing starts again. So this is managed ventricular pacing. If more than two beats get blocked, then the device thinks, well, the AV conduction is not very healthy. So they will start to shorten the AV delay and then the patient would be paced in the atrium and ventricle again. So this is an example of managed ventricular pacing. So again, dual chamber pacemaker, but sometimes you may not have a V pace speed. That does not mean that the pacemaker is not working. That just means there is some algorithm working in the background. And as you rightly pointed out, this is working in the AI mode. As soon as it saw a beat was blocked, it, it gave a backup pace here. So not always, you know, you will see a consistent A paste, V paste, A paste, V paste. Good. Ah, that's Great. very nice. Rafik sir, welcome. Apit Bhai, are you here? So, uh, again, a great thanks to Dr. Abhishek. And I request uh, Dr. Rafiq, uh, please can say some words. Because I think Dr. Oh. Abhishek has some clinic going on. So, he's yes, busy to today. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so quick question from Dr. Rafiq. And then uh, we'll, we'll say thank you to Dr. Abhishek uh, because he has a clinic. Yeah, hi. Well, I'm sorry, I, I, I cannot join the whole meeting. I'm in Boston. Uh, visiting okay. my our grandchild, so oh, first grandchild. So thank you. Uh, thanks to have you in the meeting, Abhishek. Thank you. Congratulations for your grandchild. Thanks. Thank you. So I, right. I, I request Dr. Wadud uh, to put some words and then we can continue because Dr. Abhishek have to go for this case. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Abhishek, we really enjoyed it. What I enjoy about your lecture is that you uh, make this lecture very practical, what we can actually face in the wars and rounds and uh, in our clinics, and how we can uh, implement this uh, understanding of basic concepts, how a tear conduction abnormality occurs, how every conduction abnormality occurs, so that we can implement this knowledge in our daily practice. Uh, right. That's the beauty of your lecture. You do not make things very complicated. You think it makes very, seem very easy. <laughs> Why do you say this? It's become very easy. But before that, we it become it was very difficult for us. It is like that. And thank you again for your beautiful uh, presentation. And you, we do hope that you will be again gracing our uh, forum again and again. I will be enjoying your uh, deliberations. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Shikh Deshpur. Appreciate the opportunity and let me know when I can come back again. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thanks. Thank so over to you, Dr. Wadud again. Uh Hafiz Bhai, do you have some ECD to show today? Hafiz, are you with us? I think 
uh, I think he is not he is not here. Okay. Maybe he disconnected. So today actually we we are little bit uh, uh, disorganized because of the whole COVID situation and uh, some personal problems. Like Tushar is uh, sick uh, today. Adar bhai cannot join. I was in a hurry. Uh, everything and even then, uh, dear audience, we really uh, would like that uh, all of you. If you have an interesting ECG, send it to uh, Professor Tahar Ali or to uh, Dr. Tushar or to myself, and we'll be discussing those ECGs, the clinical scenarios, what to do, what not to do, and how to understand those problems. And that will be better for all of us. Uh, Rafik Sar is our mentor. He always tells us that we should be learning in a way that actually becomes useful to us. Otherwise, pure theoretical learning will not last in our mind. And ECG learning actually depends on seeing lots and lots of ECGs, enjoying it, finding out the intricate problems and the beauties and discussing them with friends and colleagues, and then finding out the solution, what to do, and giving comfort to the patient. And very often it involves that we should not be engaging in activities, trying to do good to the patient, but we will be rather harming them if we do not understand what is going wrong and what should we do properly. That way we will actually use these programs and the knowledge we gather from here to good use. We can put that to good use. Uh, Rafiksa, do you want to make a comment before we conclude? Sir, sir, left, I suppose, sir, is not here. Abhishek, do you hear? Are you here? I think he has also left. He's probably gone for a As an interruption, Kalvish is very busy. Rafik, sir, yeah, no. do you want to make a comment, sir? We'll be concluding. Sir, you can speak Yeah, he's, he's, he is. He, now he is alive. Yes, sir, you can. Hey, what do it was good. It was actually very practical. Good. And it was actually very useful to us. I do think so. Okay. Good. Good. All right. Our next week Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, we want a good some good presentation from you. You were very interesting oh. situation. Very interesting. I'm, I'm not an ECG fellow. If you, you ask me a clinical case, I can present you. <laughs> <laughs> but clinical scenarios, those cases you have presented, all of those are very good. Yeah, we I really have. Those. Yeah, I have one one more rare case of uh, pulmonary hypertension presenting with. Uh, I think it's a peripheral. Uh, uh, pulmonary artery stenosis. So those, I have a few interesting cases, but that's not related with ECG. So again, we'll be meeting to, uh, in the next week. And till then, goodbye. Okay, bye. And good night to everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Good many thanks, nice, yeah. Good many nice, thanks to yeah. all of you uh, to run this course because many of the fellow they really appreciate the course. They really take their time out and they learn many things from this. So thank you again, once again, all the organizer to make it consistently because we do one or two program then we forgot. But it's a, I think it's a 42 or 44th program which we which we held today. And this is amazing, Dr. Professor Wadud and Professor. Uh, Atar, Rofi, and all the people who are in the panelists, uh, you all take your time out and make sure that your student learns and definitely this add value to their to their long run career, that's for sure. So thank you again. So Eid Mubarak to all of you once again. In Eid Mubarak to all of you. Bye. Eid Mubarak, sir. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Good night.